we're going to start today. And uh, the topic of today is uh, the cloud and SaaS and Elmer existing application, as you can see on the uh, on the slide itself. Um, for those who are not familiar with Gigaspaces, and with me, my name is Nadi Shabam, I'm the CTO and founder of Gigaspaces. Uh, we've been around for roughly 10 years. And generally speaking, um, I'm not going to talk too much about that. Uh, we've been doing through the 10 years on two things. One of them is distributed computing and solving a lot of the problems on making distributed computing like scalability, availability, and all those double things. And on the other hand, uh, we dealt with a lot of the uh, uh, issues uh, lately, and especially when cloud came in, on making uh, distributed computing simple. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, SaaS enablement is definitely a topic that became, uh, I think, uh, fairly uh, popular uh, within the ISV communities uh, that have an ex existing application and want to take advantage of cloud computing, but uh, the transition to cloud computing normally means a complete rewrite. Uh, what I'm going to do in this session is kind of uh, go through the best practices, the experience, the things that we've done. Uh, with some of our customers and, and share some of those uh, practices and, and patterns on how you can make a robust, uh, high-end, uh, scalable uh, SaaS application. Uh, I'm going to start a little bit, uh, not just talking about digital, but actually the, the experience. I'm going to talk uh, the, about the strategies. And I'm going to take two examples that I think uh, represent uh, the, um, uh, represent, uh, the two extremes of the uh, of the scenarios. Uh, one of them is uh, a batch application, uh, analytics, uh, like MapReduce, and the other one is more real-time uh, type of application, which is a telco application, which some of you wouldn't even consider in the cloud. <laughs> but we'll see how, uh, through the cloud enablement and SaaS enablement, we were able to take advantage uh, of that and actually move that. Uh, so we'll start with the uh, first case studies, and, and then I'll go through throughout the presentation about the practices that we could take in more generic terms and more general terms uh, that you could all apply. So I'll start specific and then I'll be generic. Uh, the first category is the batch processing. Uh, the use case is based on Pugmatics, which is the financial organization, uh, actually not a big, uh, not started as a big company that provided services for doing risk analysis. And over the time, when cloud came in, they realized that they can offer, rather than algorithms, they can actually offer the full solution to their customers. The customers happened to be high-end banks, so security was an important factor for them. And, and they started to develop that application on Amazon and, and started to develop and deploy that application on Amazon. Uh, during that uh, experience, they found out that, you know, the, the cloud and the infrastructure of the service provides only basic services for managing uh, application. And actually, cloud in itself is just another distributed environment like any other environment, and to a degree even more complex than a distributed environment that we could have locally. For example, IP can change and machine uh, cannot rely on the shared hard disk, and, and to a degree again. Uh, and things like that that are not uh, as simple and are not as uh, the same way that we used to run applications. Um, and they found themselves uh, developing and maintaining infrastructure rather than dealing with the application. The other thing that is unique in batch uh, processing is that you often need a lot of machine in a burst in a certain moment for a specific analysis, and then you need to start them and restart them and reload the data and do that thing over and over again. Uh, so from a multi-tenancy perspective, the scenario of maintaining multi tenancy is very different than the multi tenancy that you would apply in a CRM-based model. In this case, you would want to have more isolation and you would want to have uh, resources allocated per customers or per simulation in an on-demand basis, uh, but at the same time, you want to utilize all resources in the most efficient way. So it's a kind of a, a different model to do that. Uh, so again, the, 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 the practice that they found is that they tried to develop that themselves. They found themselves developing a lot of infrastructure around that and found himself dealing with a lot of the complexity that uh, cloud provides, especially when you try to deploy the application in a operating service model. Uh, on the multi tenancy side, I'll describe what was the approach that they've taken, and I'll go in much more deep uh, level into the multi tenancy in a second. Uh, but in general, again, to give you an idea of the application, uh, analytic application normally build out of those three uh, steps. The first step is the uh, loading of the data, first simulation, 
Then you create scenarios, uh, which is actually the calculation part, and then you generate reports. And imagine doing that per request per customers. So the challenge here in terms of multi-tenancy is that you want to be able to have multi-tenancy uh, per simulation, which is all that group. But then if you try to do, uh, you know, a complete new uh, machine per simulation, you may end up uh, with a lot of machines uh, that are not fully utilized. Uh, so the way they structure the multi-tenancy is that for that same customer, meaning bank in their specific case, they could have a shared machine. So all the users of that bank can run simulations simultaneously on the same number of machines, and the system itself can scale automatically when uh, they grow and when they need more machines. So they don't necessarily to provision new type of machines per, per simulation, but share the existing machines before they actually start a new machine. Uh, the other scenario is that they have multiple customers and different firms. So different firms don't really want to run simulation with one another, so they needed a high degree of, of isolation between one another. So in that case, every firm was, uh, was deployed in a completely different set of VMs. And in that case, uh, the, uh, the actual deployment itself started, on, uh, started a complete set of machines that was then used again with their existing customers and existing users within that firm. That's how they maintain the, uh, the actual multi-tenancy. The other thing that they face is that if you use the current storage in cloud environment and if you do all those other sort of things, you may run into efficiencies. One of the things that you want to maintain in a, in a SaaS application is to have low margins per customers, and how do you achieve more margins per customers? You can you can run more customers on less hardware. And one of the things that they've done in that regard is use in-memory technologies like gigaservices and other things, uh, including uh, concurrent programming to utilize multi-core programming to really take uh, and squeeze the maximum amount of resources per machine. In that case, uh, by putting data in memory, they can actually put more users on that same machine and run more simulation per instance rather than having uh, a lot of other instances that will uh, map to that. And you can see some of the numbers uh, in terms of uh, throughput and, and bandwidth that they were able to process, which I think is fairly impressive, you know, considering that they're running on, on a virtualized uh, appliance like uh, in Amazon. So those are the real numbers that were taken uh, from Amazon. And the result was that they uh, got fairly uh, good efficiency in that system using that type of architecture. Uh, so I think that the main lesson here is that they could uh, they could actually build uh, a different model that uh, most of you would think of in terms of multi-tenancy, but were able to build a very efficient model and a very reliable model. Uh, reliability here uh, in a batch processing application is interesting because reliability is not necessarily not losing transaction because you may lose transaction in a simulation uh, kind of model, but what it could translate to is that when there is a failure, and before the, the architecture was built such that if there was a failure, they had to restart the entire simulation, you lose all the amount of hours that you already processed. So if, for example, the simulation takes 10 hours, and uh, you need, uh, let's say, 100 machines to do that, then you end up with a lot of machine hours that you're going lo you're gonna to lose uh, because you need to restart the entire simulation. Uh, so one of the cost benefits that they wanted to do is basically uh, run the application in a way that would recover from failure and wouldn't need to restart the entire application as a result of that. Uh, the other thing that they wanted to ensure, and in many of the uh, SaaS applications that I've been uh, using, they wanted to have some level of portability between their customers. So they wanted to develop uh, one product line, and in this case, uh, in primary case, it was banks. They wanted to have one product line that they can launch on-premise uh, in the case where a bank wanted to run it locally, and obviously offer that as a service on a public cloud for the SMBs or for the, sorry, for the smaller banks. And by having the portability layer between the clouds and without necessarily programming to the cloud, they were able to provide the same code base locally and in the cloud itself. And I wouldn't go to, uh, through the, the rest of the list of the benefits, I think they speak for themselves, but I think you got the idea uh, from that case of one of the scenarios that we're dealing with. The other scenario is more real-time application. In that case, uh, that was actually an application that was built in 10 years ago. Uh, so the challenge was uh, kind of complex to take an, an application that wasn't really built for SaaS and cloud, uh, 
intended to be something that will be running on a cloud. Uh, one of the challenges in real-time application is latency. And uh, in many cases, latency is not just the speed that you would get within the cloud, but it's also uh, things that you don't necessarily control. Uh, and one of the things that you don't control is the fact that the actual data source runs somewhere else in, let's say, the telco operator. Uh, so you may pay the latency here that is unbearable. So even in that case, what we realized when we approached that customer is that, one, not all of the customers, especially when we move to IP-based telephony, have that latency requirement, especially the small SMBs one. Also within that customers, and even within the high-end customers, uh, they had the scenarios where some of the customers were actually needing to run uh, things on a, on a software as a service basis, but not in the production system, but for the training and simulation and the PLC. So they wouldn't needed to have a PLC on demand uh, and, and, uh, and the ability to launch a complete set of environment in an on-demand in a low-cost manner. So from that perspective, Sassanado meant, meant that they could approach a new market, which is the SMBs. Previously to that, they were only approaching the very high-end ones and in a much lower margin. And also for the high-end customers, they were able to approach uh, the, uh, the actual, uh, sorry, to reduce the cost of sales, to reduce the cost of training, to reduce the cost of PLC, uh, that they faced when they deployed new application and only provide the application on-premise without necessarily uh, doing all the pre-sale uh, on-premise as well with all the costs associated with that. Uh, the steps that we have taken to, uh, to actually take a 10 years old code and deploy it in this type of environment was uh, to focus on things that wouldn't require code changes at the beginning and then only then uh, when, we when we met that uh, uh, phase uh, we started to look at the code itself. Uh, so the first step that we've taken was to really focus on automation. And by means of automation, I meant taking the application that was built out of several servers and deployed in one click uh, on across of several servers. Uh, that included uh, dependency uh, uh, control and some workflow uh, uh, control, basic ones, that enable us to make sure that the database is running before the application is running, and made sure that certain services of the application wouldn't be running on the same machine because they actually competed on the same resource porting and stuff like that. And that's how we glued the application uh, in the first place. And later on, we've broken down the application into a more fine-grained services that will enable us to uh, run more effectively on the actual virtual machines. But in that way, we were able to take an existing application, deploy it in an on-demand basis, and, uh, per customer in the software as a service model without too much of a change in code and later on apply the change in code. We didn't have to force it also to change their complete uh, uh, business model uh, when they approach the high-end ones, but actually use software as a service as a way to uh, approach other markets that we didn't really approach. So we kind of bypass the obstacles of, okay, what do I do with the existing models if I sell them in one model and software as a service is completely different in that case, we completely bypassed that challenge. We didn't change the existing business model. We just approached it to, uh, we just approached a new market that we didn't uh, uh, really approach before and couldn't approach and use the SaaS as an entry point to that. Uh, so that's kind of introductionary to that. And even then, you can see uh, some of the performance benefits and their ability to uh, provide more density into their development, meaning that they could have more users uh, for the same amount of machines and by that reduce the margins uh, and reduce the margins uh, 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 that, th that each customer will cost them as a result of that. So this was a, a real uh, slide that was taken by them. It wasn't really, uh, I didn't really manipulate it or change that slide. I, I quickly, I just uh, curved out the name of that customer for obvious reasons. Uh, it's a very leading uh, telco provider, and uh, you can see some of the actual figures from their benchmark comparing uh, the in-memory solution versus the standard application server. Uh, so that's on that, and I think uh, this kind of give an introductionary that such enablement of existing application is something that people are doing and can be done. Uh, you don't necessarily need to rewrite your entire application. That's kind of the main message that I wanted to uh, deliver in this uh, first slide. Uh, the second series of slides is more technical and generic. Uh, when I'm going to go through the things that you need to do to make your application self enable. And I'm not saying anything new, I'm just trying to uh, illustrate how I can deal with each of the challenges with minimal changes to existing uh, applications. 
So I've taken that slide from Gartner, and uh, I thought that that slide gives a, a very good overview of the principles that you need to apply uh, to any SaaS application. Multitenancy is obviously the first one, and I'm going to focus a lot about that. And then we have all the elasticity and resource pooling. Uh, the last bit is probably a, another interesting thing uh, that I think I touched on in the examples, the fact that you do need to make it reliable. And a lot of people forget that when they approach the cloud, they somehow think that the cloud uh, would magically deal with that and they will get high availability uh, somehow uh, in their environment, but uh, they discover fairly late in the game that cloud actually makes their life even more hard on, on that regard and doesn't really solve that problem. So I'm going to touch a little bit about that. I'm not sure I'm going to cover all that in full details because of time, but I'm going to do my best to uh, give you at least the, the main highlights of the first two bullets. Uh, DSS is really positioned in that area where we're basically trying to provide an elastic middleware services that provides the equivalent of the Amazon services, the data simple DB, and the SQS, and the MapReduce, but in a more efficient way because we run them in memory. So that's uh, probably the last bit that I'm going to talk about for this basis. Let's talk about multi-tenancy, which is the first uh, element in SAS enablement. Uh, now, basically, when I analyze that, uh, a lot of people think that multi-tenancy is a fairly complex thing. And, and by the way, uh, do feel free to send questions to the chat. Uh, that will give me some indication if I'm actually uh, uh, talking on things that I would interest or not. So I would appreciate if you could uh, throw me some question that will give me an indication of where you want to focus the discussion. Uh, from uh, Again, from multi-tenancy perspective, there are two main approaches. One of them is I call them uh, fine-grained multi-tenancy, uh, which is basically the Salesforce approach. Uh, in this case, what we're doing is we're uh, taking a database and uh, we're adding a column to the database, uh, which is the customer ID, and every customer going to the same database but actually using the uh, customer ID column uh, will give him only the rows of the tables that it belongs to him and not belongs to others. Uh, the challenges with that approach is that it's uh, not that easy to implement, especially if you have an existing application, because most likely it will force you to rewrite your application, rewrite your data schema, and uh, that's a big challenge. The other thing is that a customer, and even several customers, are usually bounded to a single database. Uh, so in a case where one customer needs to span beyond that single database, that will require some manual work and a lot of work uh, to actually migrate from that database to its own dedicated database. Uh, so it's not that elastic at the end of the day if you're going with that approach. But the advantage is that it's very efficient, meaning that you can squeeze uh, a lot of users on a single database than you would normally use in other approaches. The other approach is uh, the cross chain and multi-tenancy approach, as I call it. In this case, we're sharing the hardware, the data center, the electricity, uh, but not the databases themselves. Uh, the advantage of that is that it's fairly simple because we don't have to change our application code. We just plug into another database. The consequences of that is that uh, we're probably less efficient. Now, there is more into that. The fact that we're not efficient may sound to some people that, you know, okay, uh, for the simplicity of that, who cares? But the thing is that imagine that you've built something that runs in that model, and then you have a competitors like Salesforce that have built that in the fine grain model. They would be able, at the end of the day, to offer that service per customer or per user at, let's say, tenth of the price that you could offer to your customers. Now, from a competitive landscape, that becomes a real issue. Uh, so in that case, uh, it's a simple model, and that gives you a lot of cost reduction compared to a static model, but it's not enough in many cases because it's not efficient enough, and it doesn't give you good margins, and it's uh, enough that you have a competitor that comes with a greenfield application uh, that will be able to compete with you at a level, and at margins that you will never be able to compete at. Uh, so let's see the next thing. Uh, that we can approach, which is kind of trying to combine the, the benefit or the best of the two worlds. Uh, in this case, the approach is to have a virtualized database rather than a fixed database. So we're getting almost the same efficiency as we would get with a fine grain approach, only that the application doesn't need to be aware of columns and tables and query, and we didn't need, need to change the code because all that mapping happened behind the scenes. It doesn't happen, it doesn't really expose to the actual user. So the underlying mechanism is uh, very similar to the 
uh, having a column of the user ID per, uh, per table, but uh, it, it is pushed down to the middleware, it is pushed down to the data tier rather than uh, to the application itself. The other benefit of that approach is that because each of the data can span or build out of multiple partitions and can run on multiple instances, if one customer happens to be a heavy user, the system itself will be able to accommodate that by just spreading that user into more machines, and it will rebalance itself to meet that without needing any manual work around that. So there is a great flexibility uh, and elasticity around that. Uh, the other model that uh, I didn't really lay out in this slide is the still the ability to have even the same distributed and virtualized data service, but uh, having multiple users sharing that same data. And you may want to do that, for example, in case where those users need to share data, uh, so they want to approach the same data grid and you don't want to necessarily point them to completely different database and copy the data between them. In, in some cases, that will also mean more efficiency than this model uh, because uh, having more users on the same data grid would mean that they could share better the JVM resources, the actual application resources. That kind of summarizes the approach by which we can have multi-tenancy. The last approach try to make multi-tenancy very simple but still very efficient. Uh, the Elastic Middleware, as we call it, uh, try to really give you that multi-tenancy or multi-tenant environment, um, the, uh, uh, something that people can use. Um, and in that case, uh, I try to let out the main characteristic on that regard. And you can see that uh, the, the first thing that we wanted to achieve from the middleware itself is to have one user calling that uh, service and then asking for the data grid. Uh, in this case, he, would, uh, he asked for 10 gigs of data, up to 100 gigs of data, and then we have another user that wanted to have that same, uh, not same, but actually double the amount of data. So you can see that we allocated more resources to that user, but still some of the resources could be uh, shared with the other users. Same goes with auto scaling and, and failover. I do see a question here, what is your perspective uh, on making uh, existing applications sustainable, specifically making the application multi-tenant? Uh, is it rewriting the application to make it multi-tenant, uh, passing tenant context at every layer of the software stack, or using uh, the virtualization? So my, my perspective is that a, a lot of the complexity around multi-tenancy is really a result of the fact that the underlying middleware is kind of broken. Uh, so a lot of the approaches uh, that people have today to multi-tenancy is because they think about a database and they're saying, well, okay, Database is one big thing. I can't really break it into multiple tenants, and therefore I'll try to break the application into multiple tenants myself and expose the fact that I'm using multi-tenant into the application code, and, make, and, and that's what makes multi-tenancy uh, complex. Uh, in a way, I use an analogy of the operating system. Think about DOS versus uh, the, uh, the Linux machines. Uh, Linux were multi-user, uh, uh, multi um uh, uh, session uh, type of environment where DOS was single user, uh, single application. And uh, if you try to build multi-tenancy or multi-user application on DOS, you, you have to go through a lot of uh, headaches to do that. And that's pretty much where our middleware and databases uh, are in today. Uh, versus if you do that on Linux, that will be almost a no-brainer. It wouldn't be that, that of a difficult. And the reason why is because multi-tenancy was built down to the operating system. And that's the way it should be on the middleware stack itself. You shouldn't deal with multi-tenancy, uh, especially not the data multi-tenancy at the application level. That is something that you should expect from the underlying middleware to deal with, and that's the right approach in my view. I hope I answered your question anyway. Uh, but do keep on uh, having those questions coming in. Uh, the other thing that uh, when, I, when we talked about multi-tenancy, uh, we talked about how do we expose it to the actual users. And, and similar to the question that I was asked here, uh, the, uh, the actual uh, model, some people would say, well, but I have a customer that actually want to have a dedicated resources. And some would say, well, I'm willing to share the resources, but only with users of my own department or my own organization, as Prematics did. And uh, some would say, and if I'm an IES provider, I might say that I actually want to get the lowest cost possible and therefore everyone is going to share everything with everyone and I'm going to use a, a sandbox model. Uh, 
So in, rather than dictating one model as an infrastructure provider, we kind of expose that to the API, and that's something that I expect every middleware will have uh, fairly soon, uh, well, at least in a year time, uh, where we could actually go to the middleware and say, uh, programmatically, I want to have it dedicated, and the MLM middleware would deal with what that means. And I could have uh, also a shared private, which means that I want to share it only with users of my own organization, and the middleware will be able to deal with that. And the reason why I'm saying that the middleware needs to be able to deal with that is because we actually have a lot of that information available to us. We know uh, through the agent that runs in each machine which machines are running. We don't need you to tell us about that. We know what machine, what each machine is doing, what our software is doing through the monitoring tools that we have, and we know uh, how the application behaves and what is the dependency between them. And because we know all that, we don't need any manual work to decide that. And actually, making that decision manually has a limit. Uh, it's almost impossible to make them at some point. Uh, so that's kind of the idea about multi-tenancy, and that brings me to the next uh, point, um, which is the resource pooling, which is another complex issue in self-enablement of existing applications. And the question here is, how do we take an existing application and make it self-enabled? I took that slide from Forrester that kind of showed the ideal world. Uh, one, what, what we want to have is multiple applications, and then we have all our hardware resources pooled, and somehow, uh, magically, we'll be able to map between the actual machines and the actual application to the resources. So rather than having application running on the dedicated resources, each application will be mapped to its own resources automatically. And we'll also be able to pay only for what we use. That's kind of the core principle of cloud computing and self enablement in general. The question is, how do we do that to existing application? And indeed, if we do look at existing application, this is probably how the, the way it is going to look like. So the fact that we have an underlying cloud environment and the fact that we can launch a machine by code of an API, uh, it's not going to help us that much. For example, what will happen when we add a new machine? Will the application even know that there is a new machine? Most likely not. Uh, what will happen if, uh, let's say, that we know that there is a new, new machine, which part of our application should be uh, deployed in that new machine? Most likely, we'll have to try and see, right? That, that will be the common answer that I get to that question, and that basically maps to another manual work, which doesn't really work well in cloud uh, or in uh, any such environment. Uh, and the last bit, let's assume that the first two was already addressed. Uh, how would the application be asked? Let's say that we added two machines, three machines into our existing application. How many concurrent users could be pulled into that environment? Again, most people would answer, we'll have to try and see. We'll have to do sizing, we'll have to do benchmarks, we'll have to do a lot of those things uh, to really answer that question because our system will not really build for linear scaling, and because it is not linearly scalable, uh, that answer cannot be answered just by knowing what, inf what a single instance can do. Uh, it is much more complex uh, computation to deal with. Uh, so that's kind of the current uh, state in which we are, and let's see how we can solve that uh, without necessarily changing or rewriting completely the, the application itself. So what I'm going to show you next is how with relatively uh, slight modification to our application, we can turn it to be something completely elastic. And the principle is not that new. The principle are the same principle that we use in virtualization, the OS virtualization, the operating system virtualization, and storage virtualization. And let's see what that is. Uh, so the first thing that we do is we take the, all the hardware resources that we have and pull them together in a virtualized kind of uh, pool. The second thing that we did is took the data, the big server of the data, and broke it down into small pieces. Now we have a, instead of one big database, we have a lot of small databases that represent one big database. The same for the messaging. So instead of having one big messaging server, we have a lot of small messaging servers uh, and, and we break the application into that model. Now, the second thing that we'll do is basically uh, map all those small databases and spread them across the machines. And we'll do the same thing for the messaging. Now, the important thing, like in storage virtualization, the application is going to see all the data as if it was one big database. Even though it is spread out across multiple machines, the same goes for the messaging piece. Now, if I'll ask the same question, what will happen when I add another machine to that application, by definition, the answer is going to be much simpler. And look at that. When we add another machine, we just need to add another small database, another small messaging. And like in storage, 
the application will just see that as extra capacity. You wouldn't need to rewrite the application. The application can actually be running while that happens. It will just get extra capacity of data, extra capacity of messaging, and all that could happen behind the scenes. In the same way that we could plug in more disks into our storage and have extra capacity of the storage. So that's kind of the idea and how we could make existing application, even complex one, tier-based application, to be elastic and have the resource pulled on the on-demand basis. And get, get, that's get me to the uh, next uh, thing of mine, which is the self-service experience and the usage tracking. And uh, the basic idea there is that uh, instead of having the application built in a way that will have the operation completely outside of the application, uh, like most of the applications are being deployed in the data center, we'll have to add operational awareness into the application itself. What is operational awareness? Operational awareness means that when we develop the application, we don't assume that it will run, you know, in the same way that the testing environment runs. We'll actually build code into our application that will monitor how our application really behaves in real time. And we'll also build code because we're probably the only one that understands what happens when it doesn't really behave the way it should be. We'll build code to accommodate that. So for example, if we we'll see that we're running out of memory or that the GC or the garbage collection is taking a lot of hiccups, we can actually deal with that. The operation guide wouldn't even know what to do with that information. It will throw it at him into its fancy dashboard. We'll have to code to that. In order that we will be able to call that, we'll have to have an API like we do with virtualization, like we do with cloud, uh, that will enable us to interact with that right from the development and wouldn't necessarily keep that outside. Uh, obviously, if you have an existing application, you would use that code to wrap your existing code rather than change your existing code. So you write services that can interact with your existing application, somehow glue that uh, outside of your code. Uh, but if you're writing a new application, that's probably the right way to deal with that. And here is a snippet of code that shows you what that really means. Uh, so it wouldn't be science fiction. Uh, so that's kind of what we call the admin API, but the important thing is that we made it available to the development infrastructure itself and to the application itself. So you could basically see how you could call and find all the machines that are available and then find from the machine the actual memory and get from the actual memory and, and build your own SLA as a result of that. So, for example, you could say, well, if the total amount of memory is less than what I defined at the deployment, then I'll ask the system to actually deploy another machine. So it's not just a read mostly or read only data. It's actually a read-write. You could actually interact with the system through that API and say, relocate that resource from that machine to that machine or add another machine and then relocate the resources and build some very complex SLAs. And you can only do that when you apply that operational awareness into your application. So that's the, the other, line, other principles. And here is an example of an enterprise application that I was actually built for that. So for example, what we, what we automated is a complete downtime scenario, but a fairly complex one. Uh, so in this case, we have a, a classic previous application and we have a virtualized data service running in this environment. And what we wanted is to deal with a scenario of uh, a, a failure when the database crash or one of the data services crash. So let's see what, what really happens behind the scenes when that happens. So when one of the machine crashes, the first thing that happens is that we downscale the system. Downscaling meaning that the existing machines will accommodate all the loads. So all the user load will go to only the three machines that are available. In this case, you'll see that the actual machine that exists here will become uh, the primary and will take the load. And the background will launch a new machine in order to bring the system back to its normal behavior. Uh, so, but that will happen in the background in order that we wouldn't break the user experience, in order that users will still continue to work with the application. And in that case, what we'll do is we'll add another machine and it will take and synchronize with the other peers in the data, and then we can route the load back into that machine, and uh, we basically uh, got the application up and running and highly available. Again, if you do have more questions, feel free to uh, post it. I hope I'm not running too fast. Uh, the last bit is the habitability piece, uh, my favorite topic, uh, which is the XTP grade 
so XTP, for those who are not familiar, that's a GAPN term, uh, stands for Extreme Transaction Processing. Uh, what that really means is that, uh, is, is how do we deal with, you know, stateful application and deal with scaling of stateful application, not just stateless application that can uh, map to a central database, and how do we do that in a scalable way. And in that case, uh, the principles are fairly, uh, uh, becoming fairly common knowledge. Uh, the first thing that we do is partition the data. Uh, so instead of having one data store that holds all the data, we're going to have a lot of partitions, uh, each one of them storing a portion of our data. The actual partitions are logical partitions. So the way we map between the actual user request into the partition is, let's say, based on the actual query, based on the actual content of that user. So for example, in this case, we could actually say, uh, that the key to uh, map the request would be the user ID. Behind the scenes, we'll actually pass that user ID and map that request to the specific partition. Mr. User or Mr. SaaS application developer don't really see that the partition themselves, we just see that as one big thing, right? So he does a write, he does an insert, he does a select. Uh, the knowledge on where to route that request happens uh, within the middleware stack, not within the application. And the way it is done is by passing that information that is coming through the request and routing the request to the appropriate instance. The way we achieve our availability is that each instance has a backup, a synchronously replicated backup. So if that node fails, then the request will be routed to its backup. And therefore, uh, you have a continuous availability even if that uh, fails. Uh, the important thing about partitioning is that uh, if one of the partitions fails, you only lose, you know, let's say 3% of the data rather than the entire data like in the centralized model. So that's another, pro another approach uh, to deal with, uh, with failure or to reduce the impact of failure in these type of systems. And I think that kind of uh, summarizes the all access enablement principles and how you apply them into your system. Uh, I wanted to show Two uh, picture that shows uh, kind of that it's real, that it's not science fiction, it's not you know something of my invention. Uh, it's something that is working, actually working uh, on the Amazon cloud uh, right now. And those two screens shows uh, a very simple deployment, but it shows how we can apply automation and how we can do relocation of tier-based application, the same application that I illustrated earlier with load balancer with web tier, with databases, all that can be done uh, today. Uh, so the thing that I'm, that I'm going to do, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to deploy the application. And the first thing on the, on, on the deployment side, rather than going and saying, you missed the load balancer need to run on that instance, you missed the web container need to run on that instance, uh, the, the way I'm going to do that is in a more declarative way. The declarative way would mean that I'm going to deploy the application and say, you know what, this instance needs to run on any machine that has this amount of CPUs and this operating system. Or this instance, the web container in this case, can run on any machine that don't have the database running on. So as long as the database is not running on that machine, that's fine. And or if the database machine is actually, which is kind of the opposite, is a dedicated, needs to run on a dedicated machine and no other service can run on that machine. So if you remember the picture that I showed, when I broke down data into smaller data services and, and the same I did for messaging, we could do the same thing for the, the rest of the application tiers. And here is what will happen. So when I actually deployed the application, I broke the application, the web part of the application, into small services. So you could see two instances here. There's a load balancer that is actually outside of that. There's a database running here. And basically the SLA says the web and the database never fits together. So uh, the deployment and the provisioning tools actually map that automatically. And now the thing that I've done here is actually took an existing J2E application, so that I didn't change any line of code to do that. What I did is, okay, I took, uh, uh, in this case, the Pepsnik application, and I wrapped that with our containers, and I wrapped that within this SLA definitions, and the rest happens uh, behind the scenes. Uh, the other thing that, uh, that I did was, uh, was in this uh, type of deployment is that I said uh, I put the caching service for both certain high availability and database uh, scalability and basically said that the primary and backup should never run on the same machine. So again, I didn't have to specify which 
uh, in which machine they would be running, because at one point it would be machine A, at some point after a failure it could be a completely different machine. I just said that the primary backup should never run on the same machine. I could also say that on the same data center. Uh, the other thing that uh, we did is, on the workload banner, as I mentioned earlier, the only thing that I did is said, uh, you can run on any machine as long as it's not the database machine. So you can see that it was next to the two other machines. Now, remember the question that I asked, what will happen when I add another machine? Uh, so in this case, and that's a real application, it's not, uh, you know, it's not a demo. Uh, what happens is that when I add in another machine, the system detects that there is a new machine automatically. Once it detects that there is a new machine, it basically looks at the entire system and says, okay, which of the services or which of the machines are most occupied uh, that I can actually grab that service and move it to the other, to the new machine to take advantage of that new machine. And indeed, uh, what happened is that one of the data, uh, data services was relocated uh, into that new machine automatically, and we basically took advantage of the fact that we added a new machine added to our environment. So, uh, again, coming back to the question that we had before, in this case, the system automatically detects that there is a new machine, and because we broke the application into those concrete services, we can start and move those resources between the machines, even if a machine represents a JVM, or sorry, uh, a, a, a virtualization like VMware, or whether the virtualization is Amazon, or whether it's just a play machine without any virtualization, we can do all that because for us a machine is a basically is a service container and we can uh, work on the machine in a much more fine-grained level than we uh, thought we could. Everything is a service and everything can be relocated to the machine and the machine can actually interact with one another using the actual uh, API that I showed you earlier. So we can build a lot of those tools uh, outside of the code and do a lot of that even complex manipulation while the application is running in production. So it's not just and offline operational things. Those are real things. So with that, uh, I think I'm getting to the end of the uh, presentation. I hope that uh, you're able to follow up uh, through the uh, entire discussion. And I hope I didn't throw too much information at you. Uh, but what I wanted to say from uh, a summary perspective is that uh, there is a way to take existing application uh, and not necessarily rewrite them completely. Uh, there are ways to do that. At some point, you would need to rewrite things. At some point, you would need to insert the code, but you don't have to do that as the initial step. Uh, there is a lot of things that you could achieve without necessarily going through that step, especially if you're running in a standard J2E spring-based type of application, like automation, uh, like uh, adding uh, uh, elasticity at the web tier and at the load balancer tier. Uh, Etc. and they don't worry about the database elasticity. Um, so that's kind of some of the uh, things that I hope we learned uh, through the uh, previous slides, and these are the things that uh, we've done in that regard. To summarize and, and kind of give my, uh, my view on the best practices and how you could deal with that, uh, these are really outlines of the experience and the, the recommendation I would give to every user that is facing those challenges. One, avoid radical changes. Any, any lean or scrum-based type of approach would apply here. Uh, scalability is not, uh, is not something that you could postpone or, you know, say, you know what, I'll deal with that later. I'll find out something that will make the application work, and then I'll deal with scalability. The chances that you need to rewrite your entire application is very high if you're not going to deal with scalability from the day to go. So I would recommend to... Uh, choose for a scalable, scalable architecture, uh, and even if you don't or you can't really make your entire application scalable, at least have a roadmap for that and know where you're heading. Don't just take a tactical step and look at the end-to-end -end solution for that. That's core piece for trust enablement. Uh, to minimize uh, some of the biggest concerns, uh, which is vendor locking, uh, that's not a simple thing. Uh, the, the first thing that I'm saying, you can't really assume that you could abstract everything, right? So at some level, you, you do going to face some locking, uh, but you need to manage it and you need to minimize it. Uh, so the way you manage it and you minimize it is by the fact that you could plug in different cloud providers, you could plug in different cloud, uh, web containers and programming language and databases. So you need to have that level of flexibility, and you could have that, for example, with the spaces. Uh, 
Uh, the other thing that you want to do is also minimize the API lock-in by using standards as much as possible, but as we know, standard doesn't cover the universe. Uh, and in that case, you could use uh, abstraction, which is kind of uh, another best practice. Spring is very good on providing an abstraction framework uh, that enables you to plug in different implementations and still using uh, patterns like uh, uh, dependency injections. You could reduce the lock-in into your code itself. So you could take completely different components like messaging component or remoting component that doesn't conform to the same API and still plug it into your code without changing your code because of that dependency injection because at the end of the day they expose a forgery interface that you're always using. Uh, future proof your application. If you are going to a development today, even if you're not planning to go to a public cloud or if you're not planning to make it fast enablement or, or whatever, uh, do make sure that whatever investment that you're making, do get you there. Uh, because what you do want to do is get to the point where that question will come in, it will be just a tick box in your application. It will be just a pure uh, business business question and not a technical question, and the bear wouldn't be the time it takes to, the time to market and the time of development. It doesn't make sense to me not to build those applications this way, whether they're going to be sustainable from a business perspective or not. Uh, it's just such an enablement and all the principles that I just mentioned is just a good design for building efficient application. And I don't really see uh, any reasons why you should develop any new application in a different way. Uh, and I think that kind of uh, puts the end to that, unless you have uh, more questions. Okay, thanks very much. I do see uh, one question here. Uh, Self enablement, an existing uh, application which tend to be programming code oriented and difficult to customize and configure by abstracting the process rules, functional programming logic, and making it meta driven, allow easier configuration in self service manner. Does your company provide?